Would you take your Bible just for a few moments here? I'm going to turn to the New Testament. I just mentioned this briefly, and I'm going to go there first. The book of James. We're going to go back to... Let me ask you a question. How many took notice to the mistake in the bulletin last week? How many found that book in the Bible? Darlene had her hand up. We were, we knew where it was. <laughs> okay. Cindy, we got home, Cindy says, I typed that wrong. She said, I had Elijah. And I said, I'll, I'll bring it up next week. James, chapter 5. I want to go there for a moment. I want to start here because as we get into a little more of what Elijah is all about, I want us to focus a little bit on his heart for the things of God. The heart and the, the connection that was there. James chapter 5. Verse 13. Let's start verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions, as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Think of that. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And what does it say? And it rained, rained not. For the space of three years and six months. Can any of us pray like that and get that kind of response? Are we that connected with God the creator of the universe to get a result like that? You know, most of us would say no, right? But does it mean we can't be? Could we see the results? You know, I'm not talking about stopping up the skies and no rain for three and a half years. But are we seeing our prayers answered like I believe God would like to answer them today? Are we seeing the results? And if not, why? Why not? Let's turn back, and I won't say the book of Elijah. First Kings. We're going to touch on a couple of things. I know as we began this lesson again last week, we were scrolling through some things and just talking about some basics. So if we were to begin with chapter 17, again, there's a confrontation between Elijah and King Ahab that takes place. Very, very short. I mean, it's one verse, basically, this confrontation between the two that takes place. We talked about not a whole lot of understanding where Elijah came from, other than if you would read some historic notes and information, writings from Josephus, for an example, the area that Elijah came from was very a very rugged place, mountainous terrain. And it was believed, in fact, one Bible scholar actually described in his mind what he thought Elijah possibly looked like. A big towering man, very muscular, in, in excellent shape, and we might even 
talk a little bit about that as we see some of the things that Elijah himself did that seemed almost supernatural. But we don't know a whole lot biblically about him. Other than he shows up in chapter 17, we see the confrontation that takes place in verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth. Think about these words for a moment. As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. In this particular portion of text, we don't have the number of years being mentioned, but we do have it mentioned in James, right? It says how long? Three and a half years. Now, so these things are happening according to the word of God. Elijah is speaking what God has anointed him to say. And that is an important part of it. The anointing that was upon Elijah was a special one. Does that mean he has no shortcomings? No, that's not true. Because down the road, scripturally, we will see that there was a place in which Elijah was no different than us. He became fearful and he struggled. But I'm going to move through this. Zach was teaching on John the Baptist here this morning. And we know that in the opening verses of John's Gospel, it relates the coming of the light. In Elijah's day, there was a lot of darkness, spiritually speaking. And there was a need for some illumination, spiritual illumination. There was prophets of God that were working for the basic things of God, but because of a relationship that King Ahab, who was an Israelite, who was a Jewish man, a king, but had married into, you might say, the world. His wife was Jezebel. And Jezebel influenced Ahab so bad that he began to worship the prophets or the prophecies of a worldly type. A Baal is what took place. Because that's what Jezebel was all about. We might talk or say the things of the world. She influenced the king of Israel so much that they began to slaughter the prophets of God. There was a handful of those prophets, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, a handful of those prophets was actually taken and placed in caves to spare their lives. I want you to just mentally note that for a moment. There was 100 prophets of God that were cared for by a man by the name of Obadiah, placed in two separate caves during this period of time that we're talking about here. Elijah was challenging Ahab, telling him that there's something going to happen. There's going to be a judgment. The lack of rain, the drought, was God's judging hand upon a nation that was not being obedient. You know, as I read some of these scriptures, I think, you know, those people should have wised up after a while because they had been through so many of these things you would think, you know, sooner or later you're going to understand that you go against God, you're going to suffer. They weren't too, I'm going to say they weren't too smart, were they? <coughs> Are we any smarter today? Are we suffering today Maybe because we have not been as obedient to the things of God as we should have been? Do we need an Elijah today? Do we need an Elijah spirit today? Do we need that movement within? Do we need people that pray with the power that Elijah prayed and see the results that Elijah saw? Couldn't it be different? Wouldn't it be different? 
If only we were focused like Elijah was focused. After the confrontation, Elijah was told to hide himself. Verse 3, it says, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook, brook Cherif that is before Jordan. Now I want you to think about it for a moment from our human perspective. Maybe place yourself, if you can, just work with me here a little bit. Place yourself in Elijah's shoes. You just stood before the king of a nation. And you told him there's going to be a drought. Now initially, maybe King Ahab thought, you know, here's just another prophet blowing off Nothing's going to come of it. But Elijah's told to hide himself. For how long? As long as it takes. He told him where to go. By the brook. He says in verse 4, It shall be there that thou shalt drink of the brook, and it shall that I have commanded, and the ravens will come and feed. They're going to feed Elijah. He's going to be cared for. Water to drink, food to eat. All the necessities. For how long? How long? It was quite some time. Drought continued to, to get worse. And I'm sure by this point that Ahab was a little more in tune with what Elijah was talking about. Things are drying up. Water is becoming scarce. Crops are failing. But where is this man now? Could you imagine if someone would have told you that? You'd have probably been trying to find them. And I'm sure Ahab was. And I'm sure that's why God told Elijah to hide himself. Because during this time period, the anger of Jezebel against the prophets of God continued. The slaughter continued. But Elijah did according to the word of the Lord. And he went and he dwelt. But the brook dried up. But God now says, I need you to respond. Verse 7, it says, And after... And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, and because there had no, been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying. You know, I like these types of studies because I think we today, if we would hear the word of the Lord like these individuals did, the prophets of God, listening to what God has to say, responding immediately, such as Isaiah. You know, the picture was painted before Isaiah of, of troubled times. But the question came up, who will go? And Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. How many of us would respond like that? If we see a situation, would say, God, here I am. Send me. Use me. I'm the one. The word of the Lord came on him saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a woman to feed you, to care for you. Would you hesitate? Anyone know how far it was from where Elijah was to be at the brook to where he was supposed to go? Then we have an idea. Hundred miles, approximately. What was the conditions like in the land? Drought. What would be the first thing you would think about? The brook dried up. Remember. You know, things to. You know, Steve and Sharon's getting ready to travel. But you're making preparation, right? You're packing all the necessities and things you need. You know, 
Three and a half years is a long time. I don't know how long Elijah was out by the brook until it finally dried up. But I'm sure he didn't have a lot of storage capacity to take extra water along. And the ravens were instructed to feed him while he was there, and they did. But now he's told to go approximately 100 miles and find a widow woman who was going to care for him. But he responded. He arose and went. He did this very thing. So we see in this process of things here, the prediction of the drought in verse 1. The being cared for by the brook, by the ravens, in chapter 17, 2, verses 2 to 7. We now see Elijah coming to a widow woman in verse 8 through 16 to be cared for. But there's something needed to take place in this particular picture also. Here's a woman that Elijah was giving the identity of, he would know her by what? What was she doing? Gathering sticks together. According to the word of God, that's the first person that Elijah saw. She was gathering these sticks. And Elijah asked her a question about giving him or preparing for him something to eat. <coughs> Fetch me, I pray thee, he says in the last part of verse 10. Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going, he said, Fetch it. And he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. You know, we're talking again in a day that's difficult for us to grasp of what these people might have been living like especially as this drought continued to take its toll on the people. <clears throat> she was to help sustain him in the things that he needed. But I'm sure we know the scripture. There wasn't a whole lot that she had. This woman began to tell Elijah, <coughs> In verse 12, she says, I'm gathering sticks that I may go in, that I may make a meal. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit and right now. Uh, that I may go in and, in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat. And what? <laughs> Die. What she's saying is this could be our last meal, right? We eat the last of what we have, and we're going to die. But Elijah said to her, fear not. This is, again, the parts that I like about this. Elijah was so confident in his relationship with God that he was telling her, now, don't you be fearful, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make thee for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal will not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. If you're all out of the essentials of life and someone says to you, you give me the last of what you have first <laughs> and what you end up with or what you don't have will never fail. Would we trust it? You give me the last dollar you have, but you're always going to have a dollar in your pocket. Would you trust someone like that? Can we outgive God? Can we outgive God in these situations? There's no way. If we trust God, if we have the Elijah spirit within us, if we have the heart and compassion that Elijah had for the things of God, we would see the results in the day in which we live. She went and did as she was told. It says in verse 16, And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which 
Elijah spoke. But now something else happens to this poor widow lady. The son that she had, the son that she was hoping to prepare a last meal for, passes away. In verse 17 it says, And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, he fell sick. And his sickness was so sore or so bad that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. You know, again, thinking in the verses we opened with there in James, you know, I believe there's powerful information available to the believer today in regard to how we should be praying. The effectual, the fervent prayer availeth much. But I'm not sure we believe that as much as we should believe that. I'm not sure we understand what Elijah is saying here right now in regard to the things that are going on. The woman has just experienced something in regard to the food not ever running on. But now she's coming back because of something. I mean, it's a serious situation. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to explain it away. But her son gets sick and dies. I'm sure there would be a certain amount of frustration and anger come from any one of us. What do I have to do with you? Why did you bring this upon my household? But Elijah says, give me the boy. Give me the son. And he took him out, carried him into a loft where the, they abode, and laid upon the bed, laid him upon the bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, hast thou brought evil upon the widow of whom I sojourned? See, he, Elijah himself didn't completely understand everything, but he was still trusting God. He was calling upon God. He stretched himself out upon the child three times and cried to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard Elijah. The Lord heard Elijah. You know, I realize we're focused on a number of things here today. We're fo focusing on some Old Testament scriptures. We're fo focusing on something that some could say, well, that's a real good story, but how does that apply to today? I think if there was ever a time that it would apply, it is today. I think as the church of Jesus Christ, if we truly are the believers of God today, we need to be on our knees in prayer, interceding on behalf of our people. We're seeing our homes destroyed in many different ways. We're seeing the evil. You know, we could talk about what some describe as the spirit of Jezebel, destroying us through the, the evilness of the worldly things. We see men of God, leadership, people that are supposed to be for a country. Ahab in particular was to be for his people, and he sold himself out to the things of the world. And now we have a man called Elijah coming in, and while he's visiting with a widow lady, her son dies. But Elijah cries out to God. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. These things are important. Predicting a drought, being supernaturally cared for by the ravens, seeing the food source for this family never be depleted. And now bringing this widow lady's son back to life. These things are important. But that's not where the story starts. Obviously, it gets better. But Elijah needs to return to Ahab. Now again, I want us to think about it for a moment. You are experiencing tough times. And you may be really angry at this point 
with that one who predicted the drought to start with. In fact, they were searching. They were searching for Elijah. They wanted to find him. In chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab. Now I want you, for a moment, just again, be patient with me here. Try to put yourself in Elijah's shoes. You predicted the drought, it happened. You saw a lot of heartache, a lot of pain. I don't know, Elijah may already have heard that Ahab and the armies of Ahab were looking for Elijah. But after three years had passed, God says, go show thyself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. Did Elijah go? Would you have went? Knowing that your life could be done away with? Knowing immediately as you approached Ahab, that could be your death sentence. It says in verse 2, Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, Ahab, and there was a sore famine. Things were tough. People were angry. People were frustrated. But Ahab called what is described as his governor to his house. But Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, it says. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets, hid them by fifty in a cave. Now again, I want you to think about something here. This man, a man called Obadiah, took one hundred prophets of God, hid them in two separate locations, and fed them with bread and water. There was a drought, right? There was a lack of food, right? How many prophets of God? Two different locations. How many of us would have took on the challenge? Because if Ahab or Jezebel would have found out do you think they would have spared Obadiah? Verse 5. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all fountains of water, and unto all the brooks, for adventure, we may find grass to save the horses and the mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they split up, basically it says in verse 6, they split up, went two different directions. Verse 7, And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him. And he <coughs> fell at his feet and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Behold, Elijah is here. Tell Ahab that Elijah is here. Now, Obadiah has a responsibility to go to basically his boss and say, hey, I found the man we've been hunting for for quite some time. But everybody to that point had swore an oath that they could not find him and did not see him. Now here's Obadiah given the task of going to tell Ahab, I know where he's at. That could have been a death sentence right off the bat. Verse 12, it says, And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee thither, and that I know not. And when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. He went. He did as he was told. 
Elijah comes again to Ahab, face to face. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth, this is verse 15 of chapter 18. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubles Israel? Are you the one that's causing this problem, we might say? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou thy father's house. The sin that has crept into the camp, the place that should have been an example to the world, has been corrupted so bad that God is bringing judgment upon you. But Elijah was bringing a challenge before Ahab. He says in verse 19, Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, and the prophets of the groves, 400. Anybody do quick math? 850. These which eat at Jezebel's table with us. <coughs> so Ahab sent all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together and onto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto the people and said, How long halt thee between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Not a word. Verse 22 is a little unusual. And, again, maybe Elijah didn't know that there was 100 prophets that were being cared for by Obadiah. But Elijah says in verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even only, I only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. There's a lot of you. I'm the only one that's here. 450 of you. But he presented a challenge. They were going to take two bullocks, two animals, and he was given the prophets of Baal the opportunity to choose which one they wanted. They could make the choice first. And they were going to place them on a fire or on an altar type arrangement to be sacrificed. They were going to cut them into pieces, lay on the wood, put no fire under it was the instruction. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And he says to the prophets of Baal in verse 24, Call ye on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of my Lord, the God. Lord and the God that answered by fire, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. This is a good thing. And Elijah said unto the prophet of Baal, choose you one bullock. Make your choice. And they took the bullock and they prepared it. They dressed it. They called it on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us, but there was no voice. You were well aware of the story. I know we've heard it before. These individuals danced and chanted and shouted and done all they could do to try to call down fire to consume this sacrifice that was now placed upon this wood. It says in verse 27, they came to pass at noon, and Elijah mocked them. He was making fun of them now. Cry louder. Maybe your God is asleep. Maybe he's took a journey. <coughs> and they cried even louder, it says in verse 28. They even went to the extent of trying to demonstrate something by cutting themselves. Like this is going to move their God. In verse 30, Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he, re 
He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones. Listen to the pieces here we're talking about. He took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And the stones he built on the altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar as, a, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood under and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water around the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And as it came to pass at the time of the evening offering of sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known that the day that thou, that our God in Israel, that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Now there's a couple things I want us to picture here in what just took place. <laughs> Obviously, the prophets of Baal couldn't get the job done, right? It didn't happen. But it says Elijah rebuilt the altar of God. He placed something symbolic. The stones, the 12 stones, identifying the 12 tribes of Israel. He brought in the wood. They dug a trench. Now, I want you to think about something for a moment. Three and a half year drought. What could be the most precious thing that was being used in this picture right now? Picture in your mind. The most precious thing. The water. Now, I don't know where they got it. Maybe they carried it all the way from the Mediterranean Sea. Maybe it was salt water. But they would still have to do that. To follow the instructions that Elijah laid before them. <clears throat> Verse 37 says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that thy people may know that thou art the Lord God. Do we know today that God is God? Do we know who God is? Do we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Can we put all the pieces together and know who he is? We're going to talk about the parts that make up this picture before we close here. I'll try to make it quick. The first thing that needs to take place, we've talked a little bit about this in the past weeks, there needs to be the necessary sacrifice. In Elijah's picture, what's the sacrifice? What is it? The bulks. They brought them in. But in regard to where we are in a relationship today, what should be the sacrifice? Who we are. The heart is an important part of it. We could go to several scriptures here, and I don't know whether you're writing anything down or not, but if you wanted to write down Ezekiel 11, 19, there's a scripture you could look at right there in regard to the heart. Jeremiah 31, 30, in regard to the heart. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 in regard to the heart. We need to give ourselves. But probably the best place to go, and we did read that a few weeks ago, Romans chapter 12. And if you just read verses 1 through 3, you know, we need to sacrifice ourselves before God. The second thing that we see in regard to this event is the wood. <clears throat> You know, there's certain scripture when it talks about works of man being destroyed like wood and stubble. What destroys wood and stubble? Fire. Fire, we talked about that. Fire can be used for destruction. Fire can be used for judgment. But fire can also be used for purification and anointing. 
So we have what is necessary, there needs to be a sacrifice. What else is necessary? There needs to be the wood. Talks about the stones. In the case of the 12 stones, they identify basically the 12 tribes of Israel. But it also might speak of difficult things in life, hard times. It might speak to us in regard to that. And again, Ezekiel will be a good place to go. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 28. But there's a mention of the dust. Do we have anybody in here that doesn't have dust in their home? <laughs> Does it serve a purpose? It's worthless, isn't it? Useless things. Useless things is what it amounts to. The fifth thing we have is the water. They were instructed to drench everything with water. And they did. Water speaks, in this case right now, in Elijah's scene, speaks of an impossibility. If you were to take a match or you were to take a torch and you walked up to this whole setup now that was drenched three times with water, do you think you could light it off? Have you ever tried to light a wet brush pal? Bill, does it work? Doesn't work, does it? We need dry material if we're going to start a fire. Was it there? But again, in verse 37, Elijah says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back. Again. What happened in verse 38? The fire fell. Would you like to have been a witness there on Mount Carmel when that happened? <coughs> Would you like to have seen the fire of God coming out of heaven as Elijah prayed to his God and that all-consuming fire fell upon that altar of sacrifice that was before those people? What do you think they did? The fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, what did they do? Faces. Fell on their faces. Church, I don't believe we could have stood there. We would have been prostrate before God. They fell on their faces. Their words were, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Do we know God is God? Do we know Jesus is Lord of our life today? God will provide, won't He? God will provide. He will take care. He will meet our needs. There was another component that can be added to this particular scene, and it begins again in verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Ahab, get thee up, eat, drink, for there is the sound of the abundance of rain. In the beginning of this whole setup, this relationship of Ahab that started in chapter 17, verse 1, rain, lack of, was used to judge a nation, right? But now through the response of these people, there was going to be a blessing. There was going to be a purification. There was going to be an anointing. You know, something takes place in the last part of chapter 18. In verse 42 it says, So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down on the ground, and put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the south, the sea, and 
he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black and the clouds and the wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, that he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. He ran ahead of the chariot. Does anyone know how far it was from where they were at Mount Carmel to where they would be at Jezreel? Does anyone know how far? It says Elijah ran. Approximately 15 miles. Now some may say it's a long distance runner, do marathons, that kind of stuff. Well, that's not far. But he was running ahead of a chariot. He, was, he got there before Ahab. Elijah responded to the things of God. And it's necessary. You know, we can go on here. I'm not going to go any further tonight or today. God provides, protects, and cares for what we need. What we need to do is put our trust in Him. We need to trust our lives in His care. You know, there was a quote that I had written down yesterday, and the quote simply says, if we live well, we shall die well. If we live well, we shall die well. You know, some of us fear death, fear what, what that brings but you know, if we're in God's hands, we don't have to fear death, do we? We know we are cared for. God provides. Let's join us together in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the opportunities that you provide in life. We thank you for the examples you give us through your word. I just pray today, Lord, that you might bring an anointing upon your people. Truly, Lord, that we might respond like the people that were there before Elijah. Surely the Lord is God. Lord, may we know without a shadow of doubt, you are in control of all things. All the elements of nature, everything about this life that we live, Lord, you have prepared and you already know. But I pray, I pray there will be more hearts turned towards you. Truly, Lord, we need a stirring in this day. We need those that are filled with the spirit of Elijah. We need a going forth in the power of the anointing that, Lord, there might be a work accomplished that brings glory and honor to you. Lord, just guide us into this week, and I pray that all that we say and do might point another toward you. We give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen.